In 5,000 years of written history, there is no shortage of conquerors, with many of the most notorious enforcing their will on the Middle East, the first great hub of historic civilizations between modern Pakistan and the Mediterranean. Of all the mighty empires that appeared in the region, the Achaemenid Persian Empire saw more than its fair share of conquerors. Beginning in 553 BC, Cyrus II, king of a tiny city called Anshan, built the Persian Empire from the ground up, subduing three of the greatest kingdoms of the Iron Age in quick succession. Then, a generation later, Darius the Great seized the kingdom for himself and had to reconquer most of the empire anew before pushing his frontiers to the edges of Greece and India. Then, of course, this massive empire finally came to an end with perhaps the most famous conqueror of them all, Alexander the Great. Those grand conquests are fascinating, but in between is a litany of defeats, coups, rebellions, cultural achievements, world religions, and even a couple of murder mysteries. If the stories of ancient Persia captured your attention, join me, Trevor Cully, on the History of Persia podcast, which you can find at historyofpersiapodcast.com or wherever you listen to great podcasts like this one. Many of the captives I have taken and burned in a fire. Many I took alive. From some, I cut off their hands to the wrists. From others, I cut off their noses, ears, and fingers. I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. I burned their young men, women, and children to death. Ashur Nasirpal II Hello everyone, and welcome to the Conqueror's Podcast. Episode 5.2 Ashur Nasirpal II That bit of graphic poetry at the beginning of the episode was a quote by this week's great conqueror, Ashur Nasirpal II. Ever since I started working on the podcast, I had the idea of starting each episode with an awesome quote by each of the conquerors covered that would reflect the character of these great men of history. Unfortunately, due to lack of records, it didn't work out for the first four conquerors. But this week, given that we have a detailed first-hand record from Ashur Nasirpal himself, I could finally do that. Also, if you notice an improvement in this episode's sound quality, it's because, you guessed it, the recording equipment I have ordered is finally here. So I hope all of you guys enjoy it. Last episode, we covered the history of the city, region, and people of Ashur, or Assyria from its early days as a small town of Akkadian speakers to the ascension of Ashurdan II to the throne of Assyria, an event that is considered to mark the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, an empire that would eventually stretch from Egypt in the west to modern-day Armenia in the north, the Zagros Mountains and Elam to the east, and the Arabian Desert and the Persian Gulf to the south. In this episode, we'll cover the reign of the first of the great Neo-Assyrian conquerors, Ashur Nasirpal II. But before we get to Ashur Nasirpal II, we'll continue our story from where we left off last episode, with the ascension of Ashurdan II to the throne of a stable Assyria that was far less affected by the chaotic period known as the Late Bronze Age Collapse that brought on either the decline or collapse of almost all other major civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean world. Ashurdan II is considered to be the first ruler of the Neo Assyrian Empire because he was the first king in a long time to stop focusing on simply maintaining an internally strong Assyria and occasionally raiding their neighbors, but started to actively project Assyria's power outwards and expanding his kingdom, with regular, almost annual campaigns being launched, a trait that would go on to become a hallmark of most Neo-Assyrian kings, distinguishing them from previous Assyrian rulers. To the north and east, he pushed his kingdom's borders to the foothills of the Zagros Mountains, while to the west and northwest, he reclaimed lands occupied by the Arameans in the previous century. Though enlarged, his kingdom was still centered on the Tigris River. The purpose behind this expansion was at that stage still mostly defensive, 
as he wanted to eliminate what he considered as potential threats to his kingdom and push the borders as far as he could from Ashur. Also, Ashur then himself didn't consider these raids as conquests, but merely a reclamation of land that had belonged to Assyria. Ashur then the second used some good old Assyrian brutality towards enemies who resisted, with one gruesome case that stood out to me of a ruler of a kingdom to the north called Kadmuchu, who, in the inscriptions of the king himself, after being captured, was brought to the town of Arbela, modern-day Erbil, where he was flayed, with his skin hung off the walls of the town. I mean, talk about wanting to send a message. Along with conquering these lands, Ashurdan also ordered population transfers into and out of them, deporting parts of the local populations while sending in Assyrian colonists. This was especially the case in the lands west of Assyria, where the Arameans had invaded in large numbers and now populated the area. Remember these population transfers, as they would have major implications on Assyria later on. Ashurdan also reformed the Assyrian administration, centralizing it and exporting it to the newly acquired lands and peoples, so that the expanding kingdom would have a uniform governance, and the newly acquired territories would become part of the kingdom, and not mere vassals. Another front that Ashurdan focused on was trade. One of the greatest effects of the late Bronze Age collapse was the collapse of the trade networks that spanned the Near East, connecting faraway lands and enriching many cities, one of which, as we mentioned in the previous episode, was Ashur itself. Ashur then encouraged trade across his realm, reopening trade routes while conquering or destroying hostile neighbors who were interrupting Assyrian trade. Ashur then II died in 912 BC after a reign that lasted 22 years. He was succeeded by his son, Adad Nirari II, who proved to be as vigorous and warlike as his father. After putting down rebellions in the newly conquered areas, he continued his father's conquests, pushing further east into the Zagros Mountains, north towards Lake Van, as well as continuing the wars against the Arameans, marching as far west as the Balikh River. Adad Nirari also waged war against Ashur's better rival, Babylon, apparently over border disputes between the two kingdoms. The Assyrians were able to defeat the Babylonians, with the defeat apparently costing their king his life, for he was immediately succeeded by a usurper. Adad Nirari continued his push south, sacking several cities before concluding a favorable peace treaty that pushed Assyria's border as far south as the Middle Euphrates. Adad Nirari II died in 891 BC and was succeeded by his son, Tukulti Ninurta II. Although the later's reign seems to have had no major events, it did see some expansion to the north and the east, as well as the continued rise of Assyria's strength and influence. With his death in 884 BC, the throne passed to his son, Ashur Nasarpal II who would go on to prove himself to be an energetic and brutal warrior king. The 50 years of rule by his three predecessors saw Assyria recover its position as a regional power, and he inherited a stable, well-run, and expensive state with a strong, experienced army. And Ashur Nasrpal would go on to use these to set Assyria on the path of empire. But before we start talking about Ashur Nasrpal, I'll give you a brief summary of the guy. Ashur Nasrpal was ruthless, and by ruthless I mean that even compared to the standards of the day, the guy was a butcher. Although we're still in the first millennium BC, I can say that from all the conquerors I know at least, few seem to rival Ashur Nasrpal's brutality. Previous Mesopotamian and Assyrian kings are known to have conducted horrible acts of massacre and torture, but Ashur Nasrpal seems to have taken it to a whole new level to the point that he boasted and seems to have delighted in committing them. Flaying, impalement, organ removal, as well as the good old deportations, were now conducted on a whole new scale, along with imposing heavy tribute, and these acts would become the norm for later Assyrian rulers, and give Assyria an infamous reputation for brutality and cruelty that lasts to this day. We'll start with the sources for the reign of Ashur Nasrpal II. The reason we know so much about his reign, relative to other notable Assyrian kings, 
is that Asher Nasrpal made sure that as much of his actions and accomplishments were recorded, both to glorify the king and his achievements, as well as state propaganda, especially for deterring any potential revolt. This he achieved through construction projects on a scale not seen before in the world, except for perhaps in Egypt. The largest of these was the construction of a new capital for the kingdom, the city of Kalah, also known as Nimrud, in which the king made sure that as many inscriptions as possible of his achievements were recorded in his palace and in the great temple he constructed. At least 14 major campaigns are recorded and provide us with a valuable source of information about the king, his personality, and his actions. The fact that with the fall of the empire, the magnificent city was destroyed and abandoned helped preserve much of these records and inscriptions. We don't know the year in which Ashur Nasirpal was born. He succeeded his father as king around 884 BC. Although his father's reign only lasted for seven years, his two predecessors reigned for a total of 43 years, a long time in ancient terms. That means that the Kulti Nenorta II probably ascended the throne at a relatively old age, when his son was perhaps already in his mid-twenties. He was named Ashur Nasirpal, which translates to Ashur is guardian of the heir. As an Assyrian prince and heir apparent, he would have received the standard warrior upbringing expected of any Assyrian, and would have participated in his father's and perhaps his grandfather's campaigns, and probably in putting down the rebellions any Mesopotamian leader faced. He would have also been given an administrative role in the expanding kingdom. Apparently, Ashur Nasirpal didn't launch any campaign in his first year as king. He probably spent it consolidating his rule and planning his next steps. In 883 BC, Ashur Nasirpal launched his first campaign to a land called Khabkhu, identified with Chizri Valley in modern-day southeastern Turkey, which was located 100 kilometers to the north of Nineveh, along the Tigris River. The land was ravaged and looted. The second campaign, launched in that same year, was also directed north. This time, the king and his army crossed the Tigris, marching inwards towards Mount Judi. After looting the settlements in the area, he marched south toward Kadmuchu. This land lay on the upper Tigris, and had been part of the Middle Empire more than a hundred years ago, and had already been raided by Ashurdan II. This time, Ashur Nasirpal made it clear that the Assyrians were here to stay, receiving tribute and appointing Assyrian governors. The campaign, however, was cut short when news of a rebellion in the town of Suru, modern-day Al-Suwar in Syria, reached the king, and he immediately set out towards it. The elites of Suru had deposed the Assyrian-appointed governor and replaced him with a man from a state called Bayt Adini. When Ashur Nasirpal arrived at the city with his army, however, the elites surrendered and handed over the governor. I don't know what they hoped to accomplish with this, since that didn't save them, and the king, showing the brutality and ruthlessness he would later be famous for from the very start, exacted heavy tribute from the city and executed all those who were involved in the rebellion. He probably did it by flaying them alive, a punishment that was especially common for rebels. The swiftness and brutality of Ashur Nasirpal seems to have frightened the rulers of nearby cities, as Ashur Nasirpal boasts that the rulers of many nearby cities immediately sent tribute symbolizing their loyalty. It is here that I will talk about the Assyrians' famous pastime of flaying. Flaying is an especially painful and gruesome punishment, to the victim of course, but also to anyone who would watch. Although it dates back far before Ashur Nasirpal II, one could say that the great Assyrian king institutionalized this punishment, ordering it inflicted upon rebels, enemies, and even some officials before having the flayed skin hung in various locations across his kingdom to act as a psychological weapon. In a famous or infamous rebellion that occurred in that same year at a city called Tela was even more brutally put down, with Ashur Nasirpal himself describing it in the following words. I built a pillar over against the city gate, and I flayed all the chiefs who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes, and others I bound to the stakes round the pillar. I cut the limbs of the officers who had rebelled. Many captives I burned with fire, 
and many I took as living captives. From some I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers. Of many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of the living and another of heads, and I bound their heads to tree trunks about the city. Their young men and maidens I consumed with fire. The rest of their warriors I consumed with thirst in the desert of the Euphrates. End quote. As their reputation for ruthlessness spread across the ancient Near East, all would be rebels knew that if they were defeated, the Assyrians would probably flay them alive. That's an extremely powerful psychological weapon. Later kings would continue this, and in many of the royal edicts, the neo Assyrian kings seemed to gloat over the terrible fate they imposed upon their enemies. Okay, back to our story. The reason why the northern frontier was the most important for the Assyrians, and the one usually first tended by their kings, was that as long as they didn't control the mountain passes to the north, and with no other natural barrier, that front was the most dangerous and the most prone to raiding from the peoples living in and beyond the mountains. In 882 BC, the king again marched north through Khabku towards the area around Mount Kashiari, modern-day Tur Abdin. The inscriptions mention the capture of a rebel leader called Hulaya, and although not mentioned, I assume his end was neither swift or painless. The inscriptions also mention the sacking of local cities and receiving tribute from foreign people who were starting to notice Assyria's resurgence, such as the Hittites, the Arameans, and the rulers of a people called the Nairi, that inhabited what is today the Armenian highlands. Ashur Nasirpal's campaigns in the north seem to have been his most brutal campaigns of conquest, with a lot of plundering, slaughter, and enslavement described there. Given the importance of the northern front to Assyrian interest, Ashur Nasirpal wanted to make sure that these areas would remain quiet and obedient. It was around this time that the construction of the largest project of Ashur Nasirpal's reign began, the city of Kalah, or Nimrud, that was to be the kingdom's new capital and it was one hell of a project. A previously small trading town, the new capital would grow to cover 890 acres, with a surrounding wall that was 7.5 kilometers long. Artisans and craftsmen were brought from across the kingdom and from foreign vassals who were ordered to provide them. These were reinforced by thousands of slaves taken in the king's campaigns, who performed most of the back-breaking work. Upon its completion in 879 BC, Ashur Nasirpal relocated an entirely new population of about 16,000 people to the city and took up residence in his new palace, which was the centerpiece of the new capital. A man of extremes, Ashur Nasirpal went on to host what we could today describe as a city warming party. People from all the surrounding areas were invited, with the king boasting that around 70,000 people were fed and entertained for 10 days. The menu from this celebration included, but was not limited to, 1,000 oxen, 1,000 domestic cattle, 14,000 sheep, 1,000 lambs, 500 game birds, 500 gazelles, 10,000 fish, 10,000 eggs, 10,000 loaves of bread, 10,000 measures of beer, and 10,000 containers of wine. When the festival was over, he sent his guests home in peace and joy after allowing the dignitaries to view the reliefs in his new palace. Scholars and historians still debate about the reason behind Ashur Nasirpal's decision to move the capital from Ashur. Some believe that the king simply wanted to place himself above all his predecessors by the construction of a whole new capital on a grand scale that would glorify him and his achievements. Others say that the king may have felt threatened in the old capital. What we do know is that later kings would follow Ashur Nasirpal's lead, and even after abandoning Kalah, they preferred to rule from Nineveh. Ashur Nasirpal's next target lay to the east. The king made the town of Kalizi, located 60 kilometers to the southeast of Nineveh, the base of his operations on that front. In 881 BC, two campaigns were launched against the ruler of a state called Dagara, whose name was Nur Adad. He is described as having rebelled against Assyria and allied with the people of the land of Zamoa. Zamoa was located to the northeast of Assyria, in what is today eastern Iraq and northwestern Iran, to the south of Lake Urumia. The first target was a pass called Babitu Pass, 
that lay on the western approaches of the Zagros Mountains, near the modern town of Bazian in northeastern Iraq. Nur Adad had fortified the pass, hoping to stop the Assyrians there. The plan failed, however, as Ashur Nasirpal and his army were able to break through the pass, plundering the nearby lands before returning to Kalizi. In the second campaign that was launched in that same year, the Assyrians penetrated even deeper, causing havoc across Nur Adad's land as far as Mount Nisir, known today as Pir Umar Gudrun. In the following year of 880 BC, he launched his last campaign in the east, plundering Zamoa as far as the Diyala River. Ashur Nasirpal boasts that he received submission and tribute from the leaders of Zamoa, as well as guarantees from them to send local artisans and craftsmen to the ongoing construction of Kalah. As for Nur Adad, his lands were now probably reincorporated to the kingdom, and there isn't any other mention of him in the inscriptions. That, coupled with his description as a rebel and the character of Ashur Nasirpal, means that he probably met an unpleasant end. In 879 BC, Ashur Nasirpal launched another campaign to the northern regions of Kadamuhu and Mount Kashiari. All tribute was paid, and no military action is recorded, indicating to how pacified the region had become following Ashur Nasirpal's previous campaigns. The campaign, however, was cut short when trouble and news arrived. Ammi Baal, king of an Aramean state called Bayt Zamani, was assassinated, and replaced with a man called Burramman. Bayt Zamani was located in what is today Diyarbakir province in southeastern Turkey, and west of the previously mentioned Kadmuhu. Although Ashur Nasirpa's father had fought and defeated Ammi Baal, afterwards he had become a loyal vassal of the kingdom, something which seems to have made him unpopular. Ashur Nasirpal wouldn't allow such an act to go unpunished, and he immediately marched towards Bayt Zamani, and in an apparently swift campaign, he was able to both add territory to his kingdom, and depose Burram Man, and replace him with his brother, called Elan, thus reassuring Bayt Zamani's vassalage to the kingdom. In 878 BC, Ashur Nasirpal chose to march south, in what seems to have been intended to be more of a military tour than a campaign. You know, march around with the army, collect tribute and taxes from the local towns, and perhaps drill some new recruits. The southern front had mostly remained quiet since the campaigns of Adad Nirari, and most towns gave their tribute with no resistance. When the army arrived at the region of Suhu, however, things changed. The governor there refused to pay and was now openly defying the king, with the support of auxiliary troops sent from Babylon. Word reached the king that the governor had retreated to the city of Suru. A different Suru, this one was located on the middle Euphrates. Ashur Nasirpal quickly attacked Suru, and in what was probably a swift, brutal siege, took the city, plundering it before raising it to the ground. Again, you were far better off being a defeated enemy of Assyria than a defeated rebel. A stele was erected to both mark his victory and serve as a warning. For an unknown reason, Ashur Nasirpal stopped there and didn't attack Babylon, who had obviously assisted Sohu and was inciting unrest in Assyria's southern regions. It is here that things go blurry. Although we know of at least five more campaigns that were launched between 877 BC and 866 BC, we can determine the year and location of only the last campaign. As for the other four, we know that one was launched to the south, and three to the west, but as for the exact year and location, we just don't know. However, given the details provided to us about the later western campaigns, and given that in the last known southern campaign, Babylon was pretty much left alone despite its middling in Assyria's southern territories, we can assume that the next campaign was also directed to the south. We are told that sometime after 878 BC, the southern provinces of Laku, Khindanu, and Suhu Yes, Sohu again, declared rebellion. This time, the rebellion was not supported only by Babylon, but also the state of Bayt Adini to the west. No doubt furious, Ashur Nasirpal marched south, and using rafts made of goat skin, crossed the Euphrates. Soon, the Assyrian army met the coalition army in battle, and utterly defeated them. They then ravaged all the lands of the rebels, with the special treatment reserved for rebels, probably given. With the rebellion put down, 
Ashur Nasirpal now wanted revenge, and his eyes turned to Bait Adini. As for Babylon, for some reason, it was again spared from any notable retribution, and knowing that the southern front would from now on remain quiet for the rest of Ashur Nasirpal's reign, one has to ask for the reason. Some say that after seeing Assyria's rising power again so close to Babylon, its king immediately asked for peace and sent tribute to Ashur Nasirpal. Others say that it was due to superstition of the king. You see, Babylon still maintained prominence as a religious and spiritual center of Mesopotamia, along with its patron god Marduk, and Ashur Nasirpal may have feared that attacking Babylon would offend the gods. This is supported by the actions of following emperors of Assyria, whom even at the height of the empire's power, would usually refrain from inflicting major punishments or destruction on Babylon. Having finished his business in the south, Ashur Nasirpal returned to Kalah to prepare for what would perhaps be his greatest conquest, the western campaigns. Although revenge was probably his top priority, given the character of the guy and his record to date, it's not that hard to believe that he was also dreaming of the conquest of the western lands, both to reoccupy lands lost to the Arameans and perhaps even reached the fabled Mediterranean, something that very few previous Assyrian kings had achieved. Again, we don't have the exact years in which the three western campaigns occurred, but it was probably after 876 BC. The Assyrian army set out from Kalah with a clear target, the capital of Bayt Adini, Tel Barsit, which lay on the eastern bank of the Euphrates. Marching through regions to the west previously conquered by him, all cities and rulers were obedient and sent provisions and tribute as demanded by the king. From the information that is available to us, Ashur Nasirpal seems to have defeated the forces of Bayt Adini and conquered all land east of the Euphrates, most of whom had been under Assyrian control in the past. Only Tel Barsip remained unconquered, though it was now surrounded on all sides but the west. In the next campaign, Ashur Nasirpal and his army crossed the Euphrates, ravaging what remained of Bayt Adini's forces and territories with the usual routine of enslavement and massacre. There is no mention of the fall of Tel Barsip, and had such an event occurred, the king would have surely boasted about it. However, given that the area was from now on at the very least a vassal of Assyria, it seems that the ruler of Bayt Adini had understood the new reality, and probably submitted to Ashur Nasirpal. It's true, he became a vassal, but a live one, and as an added bonus, he got to keep his skin. Ashur Nasirpal then marched on his next target, which was the state of Karkemish, that lay on the western side of the Euphrates. Its ruler, Sangara, wisely submitted without a fight, sending large tribute and promising to provide auxiliaries to the king if required. Although not mentioned, it's probable that after the subjugation of Karkemish, Ashur Nasirpal decided to take a break. The last campaign had probably lasted many months, and the king needed to organize his new conquests. He also needed to allow his troops some rest, while also calling on reinforcements from Assyria and the promised troops from Karkemish. Finally, let's not forget that the Assyrians were now operating on a foreign land that lay on the western bank of the Euphrates, and they needed to take care of new and longer supply lines. The king then pushed on with the goal this time being the great Mediterranean. To his surprise, there was no resistance. Actually, it was the opposite. All towns, cities, and rulers from Carchemish to the Mediterranean, including the great Phoenician cities of Tyre, Byblos, Sidon, and Arwad, submitted willingly, sending large and exotic tributes to the king. Upon reaching the Mediterranean, Ashur Nasirpal washed his weapons in its waters as a symbol of his conquest, thus emulating none other than Salmon the Great. And although the lands west of the Euphrates weren't made into outright provinces just yet, and still had their own rulers, they were now clearly under Assyrian domination. I bet Ashur Nasirpal himself didn't consider them from now on to be any different than a province, and he would have been happy to give them the special Assyrian treatment for rebels if they were to rebel. Before heading back east, Ashur Nasirpal marched north, towards the Amanus Mountains, modern-day Nur Mountains in southern Turkey, where he mentions that he received local timber to be used in the construction of temples in Assyria. 
Ashur Nasrpal now headed back to his great new capital. The year was now around 870 BC, and the great king was now in his mid-forties. But don't think of it as our mid-forties. That age back then could be compared with our mid-sixties. Fourteen years of brutal conquest and expansion had passed, during which Ashur Nasrpal had transformed Assyria from original power to an empire. More importantly for him, he did his duty as the representative of the god Ashur, spreading his divine justice while helping Assyria regain its position as the center of the world. Its territory now extended from the Mediterranean in the west to the Zagros Mountains in the east, and from Mount Judy in the north to the Middle Euphrates in the south. And his ruthless methods made sure that these conquests will endure, and that no one would dare to rebel against Assyria. From now on, Assyria was an empire, the new Assyrian Empire, and Ashur Nasrpal II was its emperor. Although one last major campaign will be launched in 866 BC, which we'll get to in a bit, the king now decided to slow the pace and focus on consolidating and ruling his empire, and he was as efficient in administration as he was in warfare. Palaces, temples, and other impressive public buildings were built or renovated across the empire. These show considerable developments of wealth and art, no doubt bolstered by the many foreign artisans and craftsmen brought from across the empire. The city of Ashur was especially favored by the king, as although it wasn't the capital anymore, it still held immense importance as the spiritual heart of the empire and house of the almighty god Ashur and his great temple. He also shrewdly realized that he could gain greater control over his empire by installing Assyrian governors who were loyal to him. In 866 BC, the last great campaign of Ashur Nasrpal was launched. News had reached the king that the previously mentioned Elan, the man he had appointed to rule Bait Zamani as a vassal, had rebelled. Ashur Nasrpal first headed to Elan's fortress of Damdamusa. After it fell, he continued his march towards the area of Mount Amanadu, near the modern Turkish town of Madin, sacking and enslaving many towns, including Elan's capital of Amidu modern-day Diyarbakir in Turkey. An Assyrian governor was appointed who from now on would govern in the name of the emperors. Again, we don't have any details regarding Elan's fate, but as a rebel, his fate was probably a gruesome death. Ashur Nasrpal II ruled for another seven years. Although there's a mention of another campaign being launched, there's no firm evidence to support that. The great conqueror, died in 859 BC, leaving Assyria perhaps stronger than it was ever before. It is here, at the death of Ashur Nasrpal, that we end this week's episode. Join me next time as I cover the next great Assyrian conqueror, the son and heir of this episode's great conqueror, Shalmanassar III, who was cast from his father's mold and was as warlike and brutal. He would go on to continue the expansion of the empire, becoming a great conqueror on his own. Thank you all for listening to the Conquerors Podcast. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate it and press the subscribe button. Your reviews and comments are most welcome. You can leave them on the podcast's Facebook and Instagram pages called the Conquerors Podcast, a YouTube channel with the same name, or on iTunes or any platforms you guys use to listen. You can also contact me directly at theconquerorspodcast at gmail.com. Also, for those of you who haven't done it yet, check out Trevor's History of Persia podcast. Trevor does an awesome work there, covering one of the greatest civilizations in human history, and one which provided some of the greatest conquerors in history, foremost among them being, of course, Cyrus the Great. See you next time 